What are some of the key? Thank you. <laughs> the uh, let's review some of the key um, events that, as we're looking looking forward to this last week, um, what well today. What's going to occur today as we reconsider and review the Holy Week? What, what are we looking at today with respect to Jesus' life during that week? The entry into Jerusalem. The, tri his, the, entry, the, right. the entry into Jerusalem, the triumphant right. entry into Jerusalem. And we see also that in addition, after this triumphal, triumphant it, no, entry, Jesus does go into the temple, and he doesn't go into the temple lightly. He has a major incident in <clears throat> addressing the money changers, the racketeers, and basically tries to force them out and, and, and name what has been happening there. Um, when he stays in the temple, apparently, and meets with the the chief priest and the scribes and the lawyers in the temple and during that time period they try to trick him and they they really try to find out how much he knows and how he responds to the word and the text and and he answers quite formidably they they can't catch him um another major incident had been with the an anointing woman, uh, the synoptic gospels have this woman as a friend of Simon, I believe, and and uh, John sees her as uh, Mary, the sister of Mar of Martha. But uh, the story has him being anointed with very expensive oil, and those surrounding him taking taken aghast that she would use this expensive oil while at the same time Jesus shocks them by saying let her do this I need this this is she she knows who she recognizes who I am and um at that at, soon after that time he does set up a time for a dinner with his disciples. And at that dinner, which we discussed last week, we see him directly letting his disciples know, know that he is the Christ and he is the new Paschal Lamb. Uh, he will be leading them into a reconciliation, even more so than the Lamb uh, and the 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 usual sacrificial lamb in the in the the dinners and his final his final act at the very end of this dinner is to show them that his leadership is that of the servant. John makes it very vivid as he uh, washes their feet. So that basically sets the scene, leads us into um, the next. Act, and we'll hear from. Um, let's hear now from from Jean uh, what Mark has to say. Yes. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, "Sit here while I pray." He took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, "I am deeply grieved." even to death, remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. 
And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they didn't know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. Okay. Now, um, now let's hear how John pictures this situ this same scene. Michael? Yeah. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now, Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? Thank you. As you ponder on this, let's um, hear from Amy Jo Levine as to how she comments on these two texts. You can go now. Mm -hmm. You're not sharing screen properly. You're, you're fine. I'm not sharing my stuff. But yeah, they it's can't fine. It's see. Fine. Everybody in Zoom can see it, but everybody they in the can't. room can't. 
Oh. <laughs> well, I stopped sharing it, I promise you. <laughs> Okay. Hold on, folks. We have a little adjustment to make. This will start. Okay, we Do can hear it online. Yes. Okay. Okay, right. go All ahead. Right. Okay. Everybody online can see it. You need to yeah. just change the view of Zoom so that people can and stop sharing your screen I, right now. I thought I did. I'm not sharing. I tried to okay, here I go. One participant and share. Oh, oh, look, let's do that. Okay, now we should be okay. We sometimes talk about the Garden of Gethsemane, and already we have problems. In the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, we have Gethsemane. John gives us a garden. But let's. Okay, so I'm. Uh, I don't. I have it so that multiple people can do it. Um, I don't want to share it. Hmm. I think you need to share it through. What well, you got? Yeah. Hmm. Well, maybe I share that. If I share that, then go ahead. Can you go ahead and play it? Otherwise, we might have to turn our laptop around. <laughs> I've got a better solution for a moment. Cool. I know. I'm sorry. Hold on. We're we're getting there, folks. Use don't leave us remotely. We're going to get there. <laughs> We sometimes talk about the Garden of Gethsemane, and already we have problems. In the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, we have Gethsemane. John gives us a garden. But let's think about that garden for a minute. It was in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve faced temptation and they failed. But now at Gethsemane, in John's garden, Jesus himself will face temptation. And the te temptation of the most difficult sort not one coming from Satan, not one coming from someone else, but his own personal temptation to flee or to accept the cross. When Jesus prays, Father, let this cup pass from me. Let's not pass over that cup too quickly. When we think about cups in the scriptures of Israel, we might think about the Psalm, my cup runs. We think of love. And joy and happiness, but this is a different type of cup in Gethsemane. This is a cup of fate, of torture, of death. It's not a cup from which Jesus wants to drink. And we should also think about the cup that Jesus shared with his followers at his Last Supper. 
And when Jesus hands his followers that cup, when people participate in that cup during a church service, what kind of cup is one drinking? A cup of happiness and joy, a cup of bitterness, a cup of temptation, a cup of community. Think about the cup rather than just pass it by. In Paul's epistle to the Philippians chapter 2, he has this beautiful poem, it might actually be a hymn, in which he talks about how the Christ was in the form of God but didn't feel the necessity of grasping that divinity. But the Christ empties himself out, takes on human form, indeed the form of a slave. What does it mean to give up all your privilege, to give up all your power, to become a servant, indeed a slave for everyone? That's one of the teachings that Jesus offers, and more than just talking about it, he actually does it. When Jesus says, let this cup pass from me, he doesn't want to suffer crucifixion, he doesn't want to die. But that's not a sign of lack of faith in God. To the contrary, it's a sign of enormous faith. Indeed, it's what prophets frequently do. Jeremiah doesn't want to be a prophet. It's hard to be a prophet. It's even harder to accept the fate of a prophet. So Jesus, like Jeremiah, doesn't want to drink from that cup. And he recognizes he has a choice here. He prays to God to say, here's how I feel. And he knows that God will love him, indeed, regardless of the choice that he makes. And because he is confident in that love, he can choose the fate he needs to choose. Jesus brings his disciples with him to Gethsemane. And he takes three of them, the three who witnessed his own transfiguration, Peter, James, and John. And he says, pray with me, stay awake. But they fall asleep and Jesus prays and he comes back to his friends, but rather than watching and remaining awake, they have fallen asleep. Could you not stay awake just a little while longer, he asks. And he goes to pray again and again they fall asleep. The insiders, the ones who witnessed him in all his glory, who heard his teaching, who saw his miracles, cannot stay awake, cannot meet his need. And the irony is that while the insiders fail him, the outsiders remain true. The anointing woman whose name we do not have in Matthew and Mark, she represents fidelity. She's there, as Jesus says, to anoint him for his burial. And when Jesus dies, it's the centurion, the Roman army officer, who is with him when he dies and who is able to proclaim him son of God. So the Gospels ask, are you an insider? Are you an outsider? Have you failed? Have you remained true? And if you have failed, if you have fallen asleep, recognize that there's still a continuation of your story as well. When Jesus goes to Gethsemane, he knows he is going to be arrested. He knows he is going to die. And this was his choice. When he prays, let this cup pass from me, he knows that that's a possibility. Indeed, he did not have to go to Gethsemane. He did not have to allow Judas to engage in the betrayal. He could have run away. He had a choice, but he doesn't. He stays to accept his fate because he has trust in God that everything will work out according to divine plan. When the Gospels were first taught, they weren't taught in little snippets or little lectionary readings. They were performed from the beginning to the end, as today we might, for example, see a movie. And what happens in the Gospels, as with any good symphony, with any good movie, themes repeat. Gethsemane echoes not only the temptation of Jesus by Satan in the wilderness, but it also echoes the Our Father. 
When Jesus teaches his followers to pray, lead us not into temptation. Now Jesus himself is brought into temptation. He doesn't ask from his followers anything more than he himself has experienced and has endured. In Christian theology, Jesus is God, but he's also fully human with all of our emotions, our fears, our temptations, and our strengths. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is arrested on the evening of Passover, and the Last Supper would have been a Passover meal, a Passover Seder. The Passover celebrates not only the exodus of the Israelite slaves from Egypt, but also the passing over of the angel of death so that the Jewish children are not killed. And what do we have here in Gethsemane? We have a type of Passover as well, but in this case, on this evening, the Son of God, God's firstborn Son, according to Christian theology. On this night, he will be condemned to death. All right, if we can think about what you've just or experienced. Okay. Okay. Let's talk just a minute. Um, and one of the quotes from Amy Jellavine, I think, is that uh, instead of trying to squish or compete with all the, the different views. Let's try to savor each one as we as we talk and think about what we what we heard. Um, so as <laughs> we heard Mark from Mark and from John, uh, but from Mark particularly how how does god how does how, what is jesus saying to god i don't want to do this uh, yeah i i'm and he this is a personal prayer and uh one of the things that she does she questions is is it okay to pray for yourself <laughs> um when you get into life's life's conditions uh Anything about how you feel about where Jesus is at that point in time? I think he actually feels abandoned by God. Even though he is God, he feels abandoned by the Father. There's a part of him that feels abandonment. Mm -hmm. Or at least you know, he's questioning. Yeah, well, it's a <laughs> if you know anything about crucifixion, having to face, and it was just horrible um, <laughs> at that point in time, what what uh, that type of death to begin with. And um, I guess maybe he doesn't know for sure that it's going to be crucifixion, but he knows he's he's going to be brought in and, and face. So, yeah. Um, and it seems this is in the same way, uh, this is his recognizing this is what my whole life has been is now coming to fruition. This is this is it. Whatever it's going to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just over these are overall questions. He knew this risk when he he brought his disciples. And and Judas had left, so I guess some of these dynamics were happening, and we had these overall questions. But as we we look to uh, this prayer and how he prays, knowing that as Gretchen just mentioned, and we we invite you remotely to to comment also. Um, uh, that he's looking back over his whole life 
And, and really, in a way, this happens for those of us who recognize that we might be dying, uh, that what Jesus went through is what we go through with death. Um, um, so any other comments about the hesitation he might have? Um, do you remember if John said anything about his agonizing in prayer? I, I'm not sure that he was agonizing much in John's version. He's really focused on um, this is going to happen. I need to, you know, deal with it. And um I need to face up to it. So he's, he's the agony that, yeah, yeah, the agony that Gene read about in the other one doesn't show up for me, at least in this passage in John. He's really focused on, okay, this is my job. I got to do it. I'm going to carry it out. Yeah, there's, a, there's yeah. a big contrast, actually. He's quite with it, with it, you know, he's taking it on. I, I am Jesus. This, you know, recognize me. We're going forward with this. Yeah, in the Gospel of John, Jesus in, in in this scene, you know, Jesus is very confident and he's in control. Very yeah. different from the agony that uh, is revealed in the other three Gospels. And, and another um, reflection of of the the Passover time of year, he specifically says, "It's me you're looking for. Don't go after my followers." Uh -huh. Yeah, but there's also but, almost an altercation, a fight going on, as though he's protect. He's definitely protecting his sheep, his followers. Yes. And yeah. in the synoptic versions, I don't hear or see. No, I'm okay. Fight going on. It's more here. Submission. Does that make sense? Yeah. But in 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 both versions, Peter tries to defend him. That's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah, he does. You know, that's their that's their initial response to defend him. Mm -hmm. um, does he say <clears throat> it is I or you know, to the soldier three times? Mm -hmm. Three times. And yeah, I'm wondering then if that's his as you said protecting mm -hmm. the others. <clears throat> he's he's really saying clearly. It is I, it is me. It's not them, as you said before. Mm -hmm. In the synoptic versions, isn't it a joint force of both political security, that is Roman soldiers, and religious security, that is uh, police from the Pharisees who come? Yeah, you know, I. Whereas in John, it's only that. Roman soldiers. Oh, yeah, you know, I actually, in the no, Lord, no, he he mentions uh, the Pharisees, right? He mentions the John mentions them. Yeah, the uh, just, the soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. Okay, that that's John. Yeah, that's John, right? Gene, yeah, in in, in Mark, it's just religious authorities. It's um. Uh, from okay, the crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priest, the scribes, and the elders. So it doesn't sound like there's any uh, the Roman are involvement bigger. there. They are later on, and it sure. doesn't mention the Pharisees either. Uh huh. Although it says a crowd sent by, so who knows exactly mm -hmm. might be in that crowd? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But but we're we're mixing up both the the political fight that Jesus is in and the religious fight that he's in. Yeah, well, well, this is a slice. I mean, what follows is both. Yeah. Is both when he's actually taken before Pontius Pilate and and uh, who doesn't see any reason to, to really do anything with him. But it's the crowd that insists that um that he be so as he's taking this position as the Roman prefect, whatever, that you know, he'll do with 
and basically he seems to do what they want to do. Yeah. I don't think he, they use a lot of legal, um, <laughs> that there's not a real trial here, you know, but anyway. Well, some versions have the Sanhedrin meeting as well. So he's being convicted by the yeah. chief priest of the Sanhedrin, mm -hmm. the governing body of the Judaism. Yeah, I, I have, well, we could look at that. Uh, you want to check to see that. Let me see. I uh -huh. want to move the slide forward here. Um, as we, oh, come on. There we go. Um, yeah, I had noticed that in John's garden, well, in the, in John's garden, He's not in agony so much, um, but obviously he is desperately praying for himself um, in the, the previous uh, version. Um, what, what is, how does Jesus respond to, to the, the, what the disciples do? Put away your sword. Mm -hmm. He basically, um, you know, interferes. He's, he, he might be have defended them to a point, but but he tells them to let things go forward. And and actually, in Luke, it uh, they you know I guess John sh sh says that it was Peter that drew his sword. Peter seems to be a favorite actor to do all these things. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but. Uh, but he, but Luke actually said that Jesus healed the 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 ear of the slave that that he cut off. Mm -hmm. um, so the doctor. Uh, I, um, you know, Carol, this bottle of nonviolence is true. The early church as well. You know, nowadays we don't like something. We have a protest. Yeah. I don't know. We don't ever read in the early church about protests. It was all nonviolent. Well, I think the early church knew if they protested, they were all going to wind up on crosses or something like that. Well, which, yeah. The protesters <laughs> went to yeah. Masada, when you think about it. The zealots were the protesters. It wasn't the early Christians necessarily. Right. It was the Jewish people who were protesting the Roman rule. Earlier that same week, mm -hmm. Jesus had engaged in a fairly violent form of protest when he overthrew the table. Exactly. Yeah. Money changers tables. Well, let, let me tell you something about that because I I, I follow a, a, a weekly, uh, not quite lectionary thing from a, a scholar and minister who is very much into um, anti violence. Okay, and of course the money changer thing is the the you know the the scene that most people will point to in terms of righteous anger and you know you know, justified violence. So I was very interested to see what Tom was going to say about that in his discussion of that scripture. And uh, you can take it or leave it as to what he said, but he said, he's like, no one was hurt. After Jesus left, they probably set those tables up again and just kept on doing what they were doing. That, uh, you know, so he does not necessarily see you know, violence in that that scene. More direct and, confrontation. Right, right. Yeah. And confrontation, so justice, but not violent. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Yeah. You can accept that or not as you wish. Well, okay. and, But that's you know, a, a way of seeing it. <laughs> and these disciples are armed. They have swords. So it's not like he's said you can't have us can't have well, a sword. Well, men did. I mean, that, that think, would just yeah. be normal. Yeah. Well, let's let's also talk a little bit about about the disciples themselves. Um, you know, failing to stay awake and um, they weren't worried. They should have been worried, but they weren't worried. Maybe they they weren't so worried that they could stay awake. Yeah. Okay. Right. They'd just been to dinner after <laughs> all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but yeah, I mean they they didn't seem to be as agitated as Jesus wanted them to be. I mean it looks like you know he was disappointed, but um, and I think you know as if you follow the gospel later on, 
you know, they were shocked once Jesus was led away and they followed and were very upset. So it's not as if they, except Peter, good old Peter, denied, you know, three times that he really was associated with this guy. He wasn't sleeping in the courtyard, Carol. He was wide awake when they asked him. That, that's yeah. true. And, and he was with it enough to deny it. <laughs> and then apparently they say that he, he comes to this realization that he's denied, de denied this and, he's, and he breaks down and cries. Um, so I think the feelings were all pretty, pretty confused as, as I think people's feelings are when the, you get to a situation that is this this violent and this dramatic. Yeah, Diane? Okay, I have a reading from a book called Bread and Wine, Readings for Lent and Easter mm -hmm. that Steve and former members of the committee gave to me a couple of years ago. And um, I'd like to read a, a short passage from Blaise Pascal. Um, <laughs> so he's talking about, he calls it the mystery of Jesus. Uh, Jesus suffers in his passion the torments inflicted upon him by men, but in his agony he suffers the torments which he inflicts on himself. In other words, he was troubled. He's willingly going into this. But the, this punishment is inflicted by no human, but an almighty hand, and only that he is almighty can bear it. Um, Jesus seeks some comfort, at least from his three dearest friends, and they sleep. He asks them to bear with him a while, and they abandon him with complete indifference and with so little pity that it did not keep them awake even for a single moment. And so Jesus was abandoned to face the wrath of God alone. And then I'm going to skip a little bit um, because he talks about um, Jesus and his companions. Jesus seeks companionship and solace from men. It seems to me this is unique in his whole life, but he finds none for his disciples are asleep. Jesus will be in agony until the end of the world. There must be no sleeping during that time. Jesus totally abandoned, even by his friends. He has chosen to watch with him, is vexed when he finds them asleep because of the dangers to which they are exposing, not him, but themselves, and he warns them for their own safety and their own good with warm affection in the face of their ingratitude and warns them, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And Jesus, finding them asleep again, undeterred by consideration, even for him or for themselves, is kind enough not to wake them up and instead lets them take their rest. Jesus prays, uncertain of the will of the Father and is afraid of death, but once he knows what it is, he goes to meet it and offers himself up. Let us be going. He went forth from John 18, 4. Jesus asked the men and was not heard. So he's seeing his friends asleep and all his enemies watchful and commends himself utterly to his father. So it's interesting to see his view of the disciples, or at least another person's view of how Jesus these well, and, and you know, as people get into this awful situation toward death, I mean, it, it it's all the perspective. Uh, I've I've lost a number of friends, and I have a couple that I feel felt were so unbelievably brave and courageous as they left, and it was. It's not like if you. But to see them very grateful, it's not like they were complaining that they hadn't seen people. You know, and, and there are situations where people in desperation go, well, where is everybody? You know, and and you can feel terrible because you have some obligation or whatever and you don't get there, um, you know, and and it's really, really tough. Um, so I don't know, uh, you know, um, uh, on the other hand, it's interesting the way, uh, Amy Joan Levine, uh, notes that, um, uh, was the insiders in the story who let him down, 
but some of the outsiders mm -hmm. recognize him, the women that anoint him with oil, that that Rick and and take every time every opportunity to let him know how much they care for him. So it's um it's a mixed mixed picture here. And I think in the end, I can't help but believe that Christ didn't appreciate his disciples, and they certainly come too later on. <laughs> Oh, I'd like uh, to share something yeah. that um, uh, happened to me in uh, on, while I was on an Israel of study trip that really kind of changed, you know, my visualization of the Garden of Gethsemane scene, um, you know, because um, I think we usually imagine that scene like that picture that was the intro in that picture lush, where yeah. Jesus is there alone on a rock and it's very... Um, yeah. uh, and so when you, and I think a lot of us have that notion in our mind. And when you go to the Garden of Gethsemane, maybe you're hoping you can have, you know, a quiet, focused time like that. And you can't. Um, the Garden of Gethsemane, it's restored. It's very beautiful. It's on every tourist and every pilgrim's itinerary. It is full of people. And um, one of our tour leaders, um, Carla Works, who is a professor of New Testament at Wesley, pointed out that, you know, during that scene where Jesus did that, it would have been even more crowded. Like, let's face it, this is Jerusalem. It's the Passover. Jews are required to come to Jerusalem. There weren't any high rise hotels. You know, everybody is coming. People are camping out in the Garden of Gethsemane and any other small place. I imagine it must be like what's happening in Gaza City now, but it, the, the place would just be full of, of people. Well, and, and you know, I don't know if we take it literally that that, that can, can fool us because apparently uh, the Synoptic Gospels say that he, he went to the Mount, Mount of Olives and then he went to Gethsemane right as he gets arrested. So maybe he was in a more remote place. And John doesn't even say where it is. He just said it was a garden. So so I think he probably did find some remote place at some point in time. But who knows? I mean, you know, which version? Uh, I think the point was, is well taken in that he... We see one version where he really agonizes over this as man, as as divine, whatever. Uh, there's an agony in facing death, especially this type of death. So, um, or as John said, maybe he was just totally courageous and went right into it without Carol, agony. So, yeah. Carol, I, uh, I, I just wanted to add something here to the thing that uh, Diane was reading. Um, it's It struck me um, that, you know, these disciples have this idea that they're going to go to the garden somehow and protect Jesus. So they've got weapons and everything's cool. And then they, that's, that's why they think they're there. They fall asleep. Jesus isn't, doesn't have that. He's not worried about them protecting him. He is interested in having community. He is interested in having people be with him during this terrible, difficult time. And I think there's a lesson for us that that is, that's the message that we're supposed to get out of this. That we're going to, we're going to screw up. We're not going to do the right thing. The important thing is though, that we at least be in community. And I think that is, that's the, that's what's going on here with those guys falling asleep and having to get well, awakened. Thank you. Yeah. Really I think comment. there's a lot there. Um, but it also gets into the idea too, that sometimes we're called upon to be brave in, in, in any situation or to stand up for God or for righteousness and we're afraid to stand up or we fall asleep. We don't recognize mm -hmm. where we should be. 
And I think in a part of this, I see that in ourselves, we can be the disciples too. We are the disciples too. Mm -hmm. But yet he forgives them. I mean, that's the he whole does. piece. He, he, yeah. he forgives them through the through the cross and then through the resurrection. And not only do they stand up, but they, mm -hmm. in the end, give their own sacrifices for him. But it's this, we're human and we fail, but he loves us anyway kind of piece, I think, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well... As far as the rest of the story or in other details of the story, um, we can open this up. Is, does anybody else want to just talk about um, this, these, these final two days, Thursday and Friday, and then, and, and the resurrection, for heaven's sakes, the glory of, um, of the empty tomb? What do we know about the whereabouts of the disciples during Jesus' trials? Uh, well, apparently, see, somebody has Peter in the courtyard. And that's where he denies him. So he's apparently right outside. And I would imagine that others were, were around, were with him. I think right. they were in hiding, at least some of them, because they were afraid they were going to be arrested. Well, that could be. Yeah. Um, Falling asleep. Yeah, <laughs> essentially. But on the day of the crucifixion, there were at least some of the followers, some of the women and John, who actually, according to John's gospel, were um, staying vigil at the cross. Yeah. And Mary. And Mary. And Mary. The Virgin yeah. Mary. Yeah. yeah. His mother yeah. and Mary Magdalene and Mary Martha and John. They yeah. were, there were a group of people. Some of the women were stronger than some of the men. <laughs> yeah, the women. Marshall. I don't know about Martha, but I know that there were three. There were... Right. Yeah, yeah, Mary, the Virgin and Mary, Mary Magdalene and, apparently yes. did and yeah. uh, bring in oil and out um, him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, 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 the different Gospels have slightly yeah. different lists yeah. of, uh, of who's yeah. there. But yeah, yeah. but yeah. I think they might have, there might have been, there's some speculation, but there's some people who say they went into hiding. I mean, and that's why the, mm -hmm. the upper room figures in after the crucifixion, exactly. they definitely were in hiding. Yeah, lock the doors for fear of it. It's very yeah, clear. Exactly. I wonder where Lazarus was. I yeah, <laughs> I know. I often wonder what Lazarus did after. I, I, and, I, I don't. I, I wonder about like, that too. I'm I mean, not he's worried been, about getting he's, killed. He's, <laughs> maybe he had COVID or something, and he he he's not in great shape, but he was alive. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, oh I'm my not sure where the other where where all all the folks are, except that we do know and are told that people were, you know, definitely upset, and and um, and then I don't know through all of my readings and preparing for this, I I started reading a description of crucifixion, and it was just so terrible. And apparently, it was a real. God sinned that he died as fast as he did because apparently people could live for two he days or something in this. Well, he heart. pushed aside, right, to help him. Yes, the yeah. The soldiers wanted to go home, so if we just get over and die, we can go home. Yeah. So let's well, help him along. Well, they and they said they pierced in his side instead of breaking his legs. They broke the legs of all the other folks who had been crucified at that point in time but they knew he had been dead for a while so they just pierced his side do you know yeah. why they broke the legs yeah you, well that was guess, actually so a merciful could, act so they could walk as away as mercy works in the yeah. uh, roman empire but but basically i mean because basically you'd be sort of suffocating because you're kind of hanging down and you need to push up to be able to take a breath. Of course, it would be very painful to kind of push up to take that breath. And if your legs were broken, you couldn't. So you so died you'd fast. Hurry up and die. Oh <laughs> my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Carol, I want to point out that at least in one version, Jesus said, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Another way of thinking about that is you said this was the plan. Are you sure this was the plan? Yeah, uh, you do one, you know, and 
And, you know, there are a lot of times when, when I, when Easter comes around, I feel that way. You know, why was this the plan? This is the guy that we follow because everything else he did seems so amazing. And, but I, but the other part of it too is that really when you think about it, I, for most of us, death is the hardest. It's the most difficult thing to face. And, and, um, and if we want to look at the quality of living and life and, and memory, whatever, then I guess. But for some people, they do look forward to a death. Mm -hmm. It's not always a horrible experience. Correct. Oh, knowing, yeah. Knowing I agree with you, Gretchen. But many people, and from writing, it, it isn't always foreseen as a horrible event I'm moving into. No, I think for some people, it's actually a blessing. I mm -hmm. think for people who are suffering in this life, mm -hmm. the suffering of this life is seen as harder than the passing into death, especially if for people who are truly Christian, who believe in the resurrection, they believe that they will be in a better space after they die. So... Yeah, I, and, I don't know. And also for people who look forward to and understand in a, in a different perspective that they can accept the unknowingness mm -hmm. and they can accept um, going into whatever the spirit gives. Yes. Not, the body's life. Yes. For yes. many who really thrive on knowing spirit, mm -hmm. living that way, they can understand that's that's what there will be of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to see that many pe people have many different views of where they might be going in death. I'm, yes. Mm -hmm. As, As to who was there at the cross at the time of Jesus' death. Mark 15, verse 40. Some women were there looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of the younger James and of Joseph, and Salome. They had followed Jesus while he was in Galilee and had helped him. Many other women who had come to Jerusalem with him were there also. Mm -hmm. And then in John 19, verse 25, standing close to Jesus' cross. So in John, they're close. Mm -hmm. In Mark, they're at a distance. They're at the foot, yeah. Standing close to Jesus' cross were his mother, his mother's, sis his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there. So he said to his mother, he is your son. And he said to the disciple, she is your mother. From that time, the disciple, disciple took her to live in his home. Mm -hmm. Now, where's the other reference to the one that Jesus loved, the disciple that Jesus loved? In the Last Supper, it talks about him sitting by Jesus. Um, and I don't know. I think uh, uh, people... Without further identification. Right, yeah. But all there's speculation that it was John, mm -hmm. the disciple John. But yeah. I don't know. That's where, historically, that's where it's been attributed. Yeah. But we, we don't have Mary and Martha in either of those two accounts. Okay. No. Okay. No. Although not excluded since it says among them. Yeah. Well, um, well, so that's good. Yeah. We want I to mean, thank you all for joining us and uh, wish you a, a meaningful. Uh, this is not an easy time this year. I don't know if I think others are feeling the same thing. Um, 
as the world is in turmoil um, and uh, our, our faith is important. Uh, and I wish all of us well, and may we stay in communion. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, we will not be meeting with adult ed next su Sunday, but the following Sunday, John Solomon Collins, who is performing on April 21st, uh, uh, he, uh, he's the, the Sutherland scholar. He will be performing a recital and on April 7th, uh, he'll be talking with us and showing, leading us through three of the pieces that he chose uh, to perform for this recital and giving us background and explaining that to us. And then the rest of the month of, of April is very exciting as well. We have um, two programs with, that deal directly with environmental uh, stewardship and uh, we'll also be, um, geez, hearing, uh, well, anyway, I, I will go on, but the programs are very promising and, and your community, the, the communion that we feel with you as we meet on Sunday is very important, I think, to all of us. So thank you for being with us and we we'll, look forward to being with you at least spiritually over this coming week and in the following week. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good job. Thank you, Carol. Yeah. Thank you for all the work that went into this. Yeah. <laughs> One of these days, uh, <laughs> it'll go smoothly. <laughs>